parents kick, punch, or bite 1.7 million children a year, beat up 750,000 more, and attack 46,000 with knives or guns. 2.3 million children wield a knife or gun against a brother or sister. All the families interviewed were intact. Violence was by no means confined to the mentally ill. It occurred in apparently normal average Americans and took place as often among the well-educated as among those with little schooling. The two reciprocal problems involved in the process of becoming ill within families are that the child must learn how to become sick and that family members must learn how to respond to his sickness. The patient needs to acclimatize himself first to illness and then to wellness and his family must adapt itself to both sets of conditions as they alternate. In fact, one very powerful therapeutic technique is to actually support the family in its tendency to stay the same and then wait for the family to initiate change itself. This is a very powerful therapeutic strategy that was largely overlooked in the earlier years of work with families of schizophrenics. The family therapist doesn't take a history in the ordinary sense of the word. He takes what's been called a living history. The family therapist is active and doesn't, uh, as it were, wait for the information to arrive and to be processed, but takes a very strong hand in changing things around. The family therapist is a direct observer. He intervenes frequently from the very beginning of the actual conduct of the interview. Welcome to The American Family a continuing education service from Smith, Klein and French Laboratories. The two audio cassettes in this program contain highlights of a provocative symposium from the 1979 APA convention. Together, they form an overview of the American Family Series, SKNF's comprehensive education service that examines the salient issues facing contemporary family life. Moderator of the symposium and first speaker is Dr. Israel Zwirling professor and chairman of the Department of Mental Health Sciences at Hahnemann Medical College and Hospital in Philadelphia. Dr. Zwirling has devoted much of his career to the study of psychiatric problems of contemporary families. He is widely known for the establishment of family research, training, and treatment programs of the highest caliber. Dr. Zwirling discusses the contemporary family in society. The first point I would make in describing the contemporary family is to stress the extent to which the traditional family functions, one by one, have been taken over by bureaucratic social institutions. I would suppose that the most immediately evident change in family life from the viewpoints of my parents as they might look across my generation to my children and my grandchildren is the virtual disappearance of what they experienced as the routines of family life when they were children. My father grew up in a family that was still a basic unit of economic production. His role in his family's enterprise, side by side with his father and brothers, was as firmly and clearly determined as was the role of my mother, side by side with her mother and sisters, in the maintenance of her parental home. Family life socialized them into the world of work and in turn, shared work provided a powerful, cohesive bond between family members. My children grew up with only the most vague knowledge of what their father did for a living until they were well into their adolescence. When I accepted an appointment as director of the State University Alcohol Research Clinic in New York City, after completing residency training in Cincinnati, my daughter, who was then seven years old, told her friends I was moving to New York because, quote, my daddy is going to become an alcoholic. Precisely as with economic production, 
the family has surrendered its traditional functions with reference to religious training, recreation, financial credit, political participation, education, care of the sick, care of the young, care of the aged, a whole range of social services to experts or to organized agencies or institutions. More than 20 years ago, Parsons and Bales, writing about the American middle class families, had already concluded, quote, that the basic and irreducible functions of the family are two. First, the primary socialization of children so that they can truly become members of the society into which they have been born. And second, the stabilization of the adult personalities of the population of the society, close quotes. And I wonder about the irreducibility even of these two functions. When troubles develop in either the socialization of a child or in the stabilization of the uh, adaptation of an adult, increasingly the family turns again to experts, psychiatrists, uh, other mental health professionals, family therapists. And it's, of course, as sensible to use a mental health professional if a child is antisocial or if an adult is unstable as to use a trained teacher or a trained physician. Now, the influence of these sweeping changes in family functions on family structure has been profound. In a nutshell, the family has shifted from a relatively unspecialized, task-oriented organization whose members were bound together by many ties derived from the performance of the widest range of functions to a highly specialized organization that is bound now almost exclusively by emotional or expressive ties. Now, emotional ties, of course, did exist and operated to maintain the unity of families of earlier generations. And bonds derived from sharing in the work of the family operate to some degree to maintain the unity of the family today. But there has been a qualitative and not merely a quantitative shift. The family is now virtually the only social institution organized around unqualified love and almost exclusively around love as its sole binding force. The strain that this places on family bonds is enormous when husbands and wives have only their love to hold them together. They may choose to organize shared activities with regard to the maintenance of their household or with regard to their careers, but each one knows that everything from cooking and cleaning to lovemaking professionals is available down the street or around the corner. Even sexual exclusivity as a previously vital binding force has been shrinking in importance and particularly rapidly in recent years with increasingly effective contraception. Parents and children are similarly bound only by affectional ties and there is as a consequence very little room to tolerate ambivalence. The divorce rate understandably enough has risen by 700% in this century, at the present rate, one child in five or six will grow up with divorced parents. A related but separate issue from the loss of family functions is the isolation of the family today. And I see this as resulting from a confluence of four principal social forces flowing together into a powerful river of what seems to me almost irresistible change. To begin with, the nuclear family, which always has been the modal family in the United States, has experienced a rapid weakening of ties to the extended family. If I may again be permitted a brief personal illustration, my parents lived but a few buildings away from their immediate relatives when they married and set up their household. When my father and his brother discovered that their sister had survived the Holocaust, they brought her and her family to the United States from a displaced persons camp and set them up in the very same building in which my parents lived. For our generation, my wife and I gave only the most brief thought to moving to a different area of the country from our own home in pursuit of what we judged to be a better training opportunity for myself. And I'm sure it never occurred to uh, either of my children to consider distances from us or from each other when they came to decide on where to settle. The adaptational value of a tightly knit family network is clear enough in terms of the security afforded family units and the availability of adults other than parents to care for children. 
but the adaptational advantages of the individualistic nuclear family in industrialized urban society are just simply more compelling. And especially if this is viewed side by side by the second isolating factor I'd like to mention, which is our extraordinary mobility. Each year, 40 million Americans, 12 million families, 20% of the population move. Each annual census or uh, sample census indicates that half of the population at any point lived at a different address five years ago. Now, moving imposes obviously many stresses upon families. And the one I would like to bring into focus is the isolating effect a move inevitably has. <coughs> the expectation one has in moving about uh, encountering one's neighbors is of a different order when the expectation implies that uh, they haven't been neighbors very long and they're not likely to be neighbors for very long. Moving is associated with the pursuit of a better, usually, or at least a different work opportunity, and the dilemma that confronts a family can be quite painful when father, it's usually father, has the offer of a promotion in a different and sometimes quite distant location. A move then requires disrupting the children's school and social life, separating mother and father from friends, selling a house which has become a home. The world of work exerts still another very powerful isolating pressure on families in the very careful way in which we zone separately residential from business and industrial areas. The time demands which this makes on upwardly aspiring middle-class families uh, are enormous. And in one of the papers in the first unit of the Smith, Klein and Friends series on the American family, Otto Pollack, the sociologist, uh, explicated this uh, point about the pressures of time uh, on the contemporary American family in some detail. To achieve security and status, we spend time commuting, meeting social and community obligations, meeting deadlines, working through lunch hours, evenings, on business trips, on all sorts of work-related things, and less and less on our families. Uri Bronfenbrenner reported a recent study in which microphones were attached to the shirtwaists of one-year-old infants in a middle-class community. Uh, it was found, I quote, Fathers spend relatively little time interacting with their infants. The mean number of interactions per day was 2.7, and the average number of seconds per day was 37.7, close quote. The fourth factor contributing to the isolating impact of the family on its members is the increasing entry of women into the labor force. Today, 60% of wives with husbands and children at home are working. One third of all women with children under six years of age are working. At the same time, the presence of another adult in the household who might look after the children has decreased. 50 years ago, half the households in the United States included at least one adult besides the parents. Instead of half the households, the figure today is 4%. Now, I suggested that there were data that, that reflect the degree of family disorganization uh, and that these data are, to me, alarming. I would like to call your attention to some of the indices that I see as evidence of the ineffectiveness of the uh, contemporary family. Uh, many of these are familiar enough to you. The school dropout rates, drug abuse rates, juvenile delinquency rates. One, one item, one datum, in this regard that uh, uh, troubled me deeply. 35% of the 9,945 boys born in the city of Philadelphia in 1945, 29% of all the white boys and 50% of all the black boys had at least one arrest and had been labeled delinquent by age 18. Divorce rates. In 1976, there was already one divorce for every 2.5 marriages. These rates all keep rising and all speak eloquently, it seems to me, for the failure of the family to socialize children and stabilize adult personalities. But I'd like to add some less familiar, but I think more telling and certainly more grim indices. The increase in divorce is now accompanied by a new phenomenon. 
the unwillingness of either parent to take custody of the children. There have now been some court decisions in which custody was not granted but forced on a parent. Nor do the parents necessarily wait for the divorce. More and more married women, mothers of children, are reported to police departments as missing. And I understand there's a real boom in the private detective business financed by fathers left with their children and desperately trying to locate their runaway wives. <clears throat> the New York Times on March 20th, 1977, reported on a study of 2,143 married couples uh, who had been selected to represent a demographic cross-section of American families. And I'd like to quote from uh, their report. Quote, parents kick, punch, or bite 1.7 million children a year, beat up 750,000 more, and attack 46,000 with knives or guns. 2.3 million children wield a knife or gun against a brother or sister. All the families interviewed were intact. Violence was by no means confined to the mentally ill. It occurred in apparently normal average Americans and took place as often among the well-educated as among those with little schooling." Close quotes. The suicide rate in children from ages 10 to 14 has doubled, and in children from 15 to 19 has tripled in the last 20 years. Even more gruesome, I think, are the instances of child abuse, including infanticide, the killing of infants under one year of age. This also has been increasing apparently a real increase and not just a reflection of the greater care uh, exercised currently in reporting. <coughs> Extrapolations from recent data suggest that we can expect between two to four million battered children cases to be reported this year. Of these, 1,500 children will die, 15,000 will suffer permanent brain damage. And finally, some recent data suggest that marriage and childbearing are themselves receding in popularity. The probability of first marriage, for example, for a woman 18 to 22 years of age has declined by more than 10% just in the last five years. The only exception to the decreasing fertility rate in the United States appears to be in the age group 12 to 19. And I quote from Ryder's report, uh, these women or girls, half of whom are unmarried, now account for 21% of all births in the United States. Pregnancies in teenage girls increased by 33% between 1971 and 1976, close quotes. Now the data I've uh, hurriedly presented uh, leaves, for me at least, little doubt that the functioning of the contemporary family is somehow faulty but I would caution against the conclusion that uh, the institution of the family is therefore faulty. I wish I could believe that. It would be then comparatively at least a simple matter to identify the fault in the structure of the family and to make efforts to correct it. But you see, the fault doesn't lie in the unscientific way we choose our mates or in the poor press which marriage enjoys. The family is a social institution, and in its dislocations and stresses, it reflects with exquisite sensitivity the dislocations and stresses which originate in the society and the culture. Jules Henry put this point with chilling clarity in his book, Pathways to Madness. And I quote, the family, he wrote, is the place where the general pathology of the culture is incubated, concentrated, and finally, transmitted into individual psychosis. Family therapy is a good thing, and family dynamics is a valid theory. But let us remember that the family merely distills into a lethal dose what exists in the culture at large. And it's instructive, though I think quite discouraging, to examine some recent efforts to regulate the impact of social change on the family by establishing a national policy with regard to families. The front page of the New York Times on June 19, 1978, carried an article headlined, quote, U.S. Family Conference Delayed Amid Dispute and Resignation, quote. It reported the controversy stirred up by the appointment by the Secretary of HEW of Mrs. Patsy Fleming 
as director of a White House conference which was to have convened experts from the social, behavioral, and political sciences to assess the state of the contemporary family and to recommend a national family policy. Mrs. Fleming is a divorced black woman. The newspaper article stated that her appointment by Mr. Califano had evoked criticism from religious and other groups, and she had therefore been asked to share the directorship with a white Catholic man from an intact family. Mrs. Fleming promptly resigned. And rather than face the criticism which was certain to develop if her resignation was accepted, the entire conference was, quote, postponed, quote. Now I see in microcosm in this episode three points I would like to make. First, that we do not indeed have a national family policy. Second, that there is virtually no issue of national policy which does not have an impact upon the contemporary family. And third, that any attempt to establish a national policy, even to resolve an individual broad family policy, evokes oppositional forces, and these in turn counter forces, which preclude the establishment of a consistent family policy, or even the resolution of an individual broad family issue. I've made the uh, uh, the point earlier about the uh, increasing representation of women in the workforce and of the many issues one could pick uh, in the uh, contemporary uh, national scene, unemployment, transportation, welfare, equal rights amendment, whatever, uh, with inescapable immediate impact on the family. I would like very briefly to talk some about the impact of the working woman on the family. For one thing, the daycare industry has burgeoned as one consequence, and all the assumptions about the crucial role of object constancy in the early personality development of children, it seems to me are being currently tested in a social experiment of massive proportions, particularly in the light of the fact that daycare centers have, as you know, one of the most rapidly revolving uh, uh, workforce situations. Now, a second observation that flows from this, the essentially complementary relationship between husband and wife tends more and more to become a symmetrical relationship when the woman starts to work. And all the assumptions about the crucial role of a clear, sharp differentiation of sexual roles between the parents for the formation of a clear and consistent gender identity in the child are similarly being tested. The inevitable pressure of a working wife on a marriage relationship is towards a more egalitarian, more democratic union. And the fundamental tenets of Parsonian family sociology regarding the instrumental role of the husband and the expressive role of the wife as essential prerequisites for a harmonious marital relationship are now also under suspension. I think in a way we can begin to perceive an answer to the question, why do we have so many anti-family programs in welfare, in housing, and so on? Why have they persisted for so long? If we read the epilogue to the immensely popular book, All Our Children, by Kenneth Keniston, published, uh, what, two years ago, under the aegis of the Carnegie Foundation. In the final brief section, which he titles, A Vision of the Possible, he writes, quote, the society we imagine would be one that put children first, not last, that saw the development of a vital, resourceful, caring, moral generation of Americans as the nation's highest priority. The next generation's strength and well-being would be everyone's responsibility. How will it affect all our children would be the first question we ask of every new technology, each innovation, all policies, close quotes. <clears throat> and a bit further in this vision of the possible, he adds, it would be a society where parents had available to them the kinds of help they needed and where they had a powerful voice in every institution affecting them and their children. It would be a society where present excessive inequalities of income, power, and dignity were much reduced. Close quotes. In effect, Keniston and the Carnegie Council on Children are suggesting that nothing short of a radical revision of our social structure can make it possible for their recommendations uh, to be implemented. 
And as I see it, this is the crux of the matter. We have no consistent family policy in the United States because such a policy is not possible within the existing social structure. We continue to apply a simplistic, linear approach to individual issues, which we carefully isolate from all other issues. That is, if we have a drug problem, we organize drug programs to solve the drug problem. If we have a housing problem, we establish a housing program, or even better, several competing contradictory housing programs to solve the housing problem. And I think we do this not because we don't know about general systems theory, and not, that, not because we don't know about feedback circuits, but because a systems approach with the welfare of people as the goal of the social system would require the kind of complete reconstruction of our society, which we quite clearly are simply not prepared now to undertake. Nor are we prepared to undertake the cost of such programs. Keniston and many others are calling for a restoration of a sense of community. He writes, the next generation's strength and well-being would become everyone's responsibility. But the public school system in my city, Philadelphia, and in a dozen other cities, may or may not have enough funds to limp through this school year, the public school system. And California's Proposition 13 seems to be sweeping the nation. And a national health insurance program keeps receding in time, at the same time that the benefits and the leading proposals keep diminishing. And I don't think we have unlimited time in which to work all this out. The inability of our society to provide support for the contemporary family as a matter of national policy is occurring in a democratic context in which today some 70% of our population supports the 30% who are now too young or too old to work. We now have about 22 million persons over 65 years of age. By the year 2000, it is estimated that there will be 32 million. And the 70% who support the nation will have shrunk to 60% or less. If 70% of us are already so reluctant to support the other 30%, how will 60% of us feel about supporting the other 40%? I worry about this. We might begin to prepare for what lies ahead by reading John Donne's devotions together and reminding ourselves over and over that the bell tolls for all of us. Thank you. Our program continues in just a moment. First, here's a message from SKNF. Communication. The passage of information from one person to another. Rapid progress has been made in the communications field since the advent of sophisticated technological equipment. Telegraph, telephone, radio, computer, capable of carrying messages over long distances. Similar progress was made in the area of interpersonal communications when Stelazine, SKNF Company's brand of trifluoroperazine hydrochloride, was introduced some 20 years ago. Stelazine enabled physicians to reach withdrawn schizophrenics for the first time to close the distance between therapist and patient. Today, Stelazine remains a first choice antipsychotic. Because it controls disruptive symptoms and helps patients respond to your messages, Stelazine facilitates the therapeutic process. Stelazine apparently activates withdrawn patients and calms agitated psychotics as well. It reduces hallucinations, delusions, and other psychotic symptoms in a wide range of patients, from agitated to withdrawn. Its convenient BID dosage saves both time and money, and its six flexible dosage forms and strengths meet a variety of needs. Stelazine injection is particularly useful in emergency situations. Stelazine is contraindicated in comatose or greatly depressed states due to CNS depressants in cases of existing blood dyscrasias, bone marrow depression, and pre-existing liver damage. Avoid using in patients hypersensitive to phenothiazines. Physicians should be alert for neuromuscular reactions, including tardive dyskinesia and other adverse effects associated with phenothiazine therapy. 
Dosage requirements of patients on high-dose long-term therapy should be evaluated periodically. Before prescribing Stelazine, please consult the accompanying booklet for complete product information, including additional warnings, precautions, and adverse reactions. Stelazine helps you communicate with your patients. This overview of the American Family series continues on the second side of this cassette.